I'm Laura Shefstack, scientific editor at Cell, and I'm here at the 84th Cold Spring Harbor Symposium, RNA Control and Regulation. And I'm talking today with Andres Aguilera from the University of Seville. Hello. Hi, Laura. Well, so I'm very excited to get to talk to you in person. Um, it's nice to be able to look someone in the eye and hear mm. about their work. It's different than reading their papers. Um, but I have to ask to start um, a question about why you're here at this meeting, because when I look at your website and I think about the work that you've done, RNA control and regulation doesn't exactly come to mind because it's more focused on uh, genome instability. Um, and so where do you think the worlds of genome instability and RNA-based control mechanisms come together? Right, that's a, that's a very interesting uh, and key question for my career indeed. Uh, yes, our main interest is to understand the mechanisms of genome instability. But it turned out that more than about 20 years ago, we ended into trying to understand a number of, of proteins and genes that where their main function was to maintain the genome stable. And then, little by little, we ended into realizing that this was a genome maintenance that was very much depending on transcription. And then we ended into the discovery of the R loops as a main source of, of this instability that was produced in, in, in the cells when these proteins disappear. Then this has be, became now, uh, along the years, uh, uh, an important aspect or an import important, let's say, source of genome instability. The RNA that is being produced during transcription, then it may go back to the DNA where it came from and form a DNA-RNA hybrid. Mm -hmm. And then the formation of this DNA-RNA DNA -RNA hybrid, if it is not uh, regulated in a natural way, then uh, it would lead to a block of the replication form on the one hand, or it might create a loop in the DNA that may be subject to the attack by different genotoxics, and that leads to DNA damage, DNA breaks, that is what lead to genome stability. Therefore, we realize that now when, the, when transcription the main uh, goal of transcription is to produce the RNA. It deals with many dangers. And one of the dangers is that it has to be careful that the RNA that is being produced doesn't have the opportunity to go back and form this DNA-RNA habit. That's the R loop, right? That is the R loop. Mm -hmm. And therefore, this is where the two fields uh, join together. And this is why <laughs> I, I believe I'm here, no? trying mm -hmm. to understand this aspect of transcription that so far, it has not been studied that much, but now there are, I believe, many groups indeed that are trying to understand what is the, whether there is a special machinery in the cell that try to control this, uh, this nascent RNA, RNA to avoid that the, it forms this DNA RNA habit that is going to be harmful for the cell. And so if you, if you go back to the cells, so what's, what's the evidence that these actually do form. I mean, clearly they yeah. can, but yeah. that they do and that they contribute to Yeah, this is a, a, a very interesting question. I mean, uh, the DNA RNA hybrids are uh, present in a number of, of processes that have a, a natural relevance. For example, in class switching recombination, mm -hmm. in mitochondrial DNA replication, mm -hmm. we are talking about unscheduled DNA RNA hybrids that theoretically shouldn't be formed. It can be uh, tested by different manners, by purifying the DNA uh, from the cell and then doing different treatment with uh, RNase A, RNase H, and so that you are able to distinguish the, the kind of structure of each form. But the most popular way of detecting these hybrids now is a monoclonal antibody that was developed in the 80s, and this antibody is used now worldwide to detect the DNA RNA hybrids by DNA RNA immunoprecipitation and by immunofluorescence. It is true, anyhow, that this antibody can recognize also double standard RNA. Therefore, it is very uh, important that in doing this analysis, we have to remove always the signal that is uh, recovered by the antibody by using RNase H, because RNase H is known to specifically degrade the RNA moiety of the DNA RNA hybrid. Mm -hmm. Then this is the most popular a way of detecting them. But now people is developing other ways. For example, we have fused the DNA RNA hybrid domain of RNAs H uh, mm -hmm. fused to GFP and this is a way just to detect the, the hybrid directly and some other people is using 
a mutated uh, RNAs age so that when it goes to the DNA RNA hybrids to eliminate the RNA is not able to do that, then it is used as some mark that the DNA RNA hybrid, hybrid exists there. And when you when you use those kinds of approaches, how frequently do you see well, R loops happening? Yeah, that's a, that is a very important question, frequency. We really don't know, it's very low. What happens is that in most of this analysis is done by, by genome-wide uh, immunoprecipitation, and usually that means that we are dealing with a population of cells. Right. Then that allows us to see where the hybrids is formed. Mm -hmm. But if we now try to identify the frequency at which in a particular point it occurs, is very low. For example, we have tried to see that in G cells, uh, uh, getting single cells and single colonies, and we have gone through 500 different colonies to check in a particular site, and we didn't find the evidence for the hybrid being formed. Therefore, that means that the hybrid is not something occurring very frequently, mm -hmm. but it's very important. Why? Because once it is formed, it can lead to a damage, and it's the same thing as a double strand break. No, Spontaneously, a break does not occur very frequently, but when it happens, the consequences are very important. Then the key question here is that if you remove the machinery yeah. in the cell that prevent the formation of the hybrids or that eliminate the hybrids, then the frequency goes high to a level that you get breaks at a high level and that is going to be harmful for the cell. And so what do we know about the machinery? That's, okay, I would divide the machinery in three uh, main uh, type of functions. One, the first one is the, the, the proteins that prevent during transcription the formation of the R loops. Mm -hmm. And these usually are proteins that are involved in RNA processing. And the main function is probably the RNA export and transcription. It has to do with RNA metabolism itself. Mm -hmm. But collaterally, they are preventing the formation of the loop because if the RNA, the nascent RNA is packed by proteins in an mRNP particle, then that mRNP particle is not free to hybridize back with the DNA. That is, would be the first body of proteins that prevent the formation. The second is, if spontaneously, those hybrids are formed. Now you need a machinery to remove them. Mm -hmm. The most known one is RNA-SH. But if you think in terms of transcription, you don't want to eliminate the RNA that is just, just being produced. Imagine in, in, in gene, genes in human cells that can be 600 kb, and then spontaneously a short region from the DNA RNA hybrid. If this is removed by RNA-SH, then it will cleave the RNA. Therefore, you destroy the RNA, you have to start back again. Therefore, you want to eliminate the hybrid by allowing the RNA to stay there. Therefore, helicases of DNA RNA are a second step. But if they still remain there, the problem is coming after the cells get into S phase and the replication force comes and finds the hybrid. Mm -hmm. Then there, there is a number of, of proteins that are involved in DNA repair, including Fanconi anemia, BRCA, okay. and then when you remove them, you see the accumulation of the hybrids. But not because you form more hybrids. It's because the form gets tall there mm -hmm. and you are not able to remove them and therefore the hybrid remains there. Mm -hmm. And so for y your talk isn't until tomorrow, I yeah, think. Tonight, but Oh, that's tonight, tomorrow. sorry. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it hasn't happened yet. Um, and so I wonder if you can give us a bit of a teaser for the kind of work. So you've, you've outlined these three types, right. types of machinery. Right. So what, what are you most excited about right now? Well, I'm the most excited about the, the idea that during transcription, uh, we never thought that cells has collaterally developed a, a extra function for proteins that are already there to prevent the formation of our loops. And then one of the things that we have found is these RNA binding proteins talk directly to chromatin remodelers in a way that the way we believe is that once the RNA is coming out of the RNA polymerase and it binds to these proteins, the ones that we are focusing, for example, are the Tho complex and some others, they talk to the uh, chromatin, uh, to histone deacetylases as a way to what we believe might be uh, transiently close chromatin to avoid that the RNA uh, gets back into the DNA because when you have deacetylated chromatin, you have more compacted chromatin and mm -hmm. therefore you avoid that. But at the same time, they talk to one known RNA helicase, that is UAP56 mm -hmm. in, in human cells, that is very abundant RNA helicase, is known to be an RNA chaperone mm -hmm. that works in splicing and everything. But then we see that these proteins are DNA, RNA, and winding ability. 
and when we overexpress this protein, we are able to eliminate hybrids, overproduce in a number of conditions when we eliminate a number mm -hmm. of cells. Therefore, we believe that the, during transcription, there is this associated machinery that is working as a kind of checkpoint on the one side, but at the same time as a kind of machinery that prevent, prevent the formation of their loops, but if they are formed, they will open the DNA RNA hybrid so that it will allow the transcription to move on. Therefore, I think this is a concept that we never thought before, but then I think this explains why we started trying to understand uh, the, the origin of genome instability, mm -hmm. and we ended into trying to, to understand what happened with the RNA that is coming out during transcription so that the thirst has developed this machinery mm -hmm. to, to eliminate it. Long ago, it was suggested that probably in bacteria, this is probably not a major problem at, at this level because in bacteria, you know, there is a, a, a co-transcriptional translation. Therefore, the ribosomes get onto the RNA at the same time it's being produced. Therefore, that somehow is also preventing the formation of the hybrid because this RNA cannot mm -hmm. go back to the DNA. Therefore, in nature, the, the, the danger of this nascent RNA to go back to the DNA and form the hybrid that would become harmful is there. And the, in evolution, cells has developed this ancillary machinery just to, to prevent and to eliminate them. Yeah. I mean, I think there have been recent examples in bacteria, not to, to completely um, go off on a tangent, where there is uncoupling Absolutely. between transcription and right, translation. Right. And so it seems like a place where maybe some new discovery can go back and Ab happen if, if you're thinking about this mechanism. Absolutely, absolutely. Actually, and for example, in bacteria, there is uh, examples no, on, on RNA polymerase backtracking mm -hmm. in which you, you are really dealing with all this and then you get a, a higher chances of, of hybrids remaining there. Even though the mechanism may be different because the RNA polymerase is coming back. Therefore, there might be different ways of, of affecting that. Uh, I believe that the, the field is, is opening and expanding, and probably we have to be cautious now, because uh, one of the, the, the major issues that I'm finding now is that there are many RNA helicases that when you go to in vitro and mm -hmm. check activity, most of them open DNA RNA in vitro, but that doesn't mean that they were like that in vivo. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, I think we have data that suggests that only few of the proteins are really involved into this, and many others we have to be cautious. At, at the moment, we make conclusions from trying to transfer what we see in vitro to what we see in vivo because many of these proteins are RNA chaperones. And it's hard to explain that the cells are going to have so many DNA RNA helicases so that by just removing one, you will get the same phenotype as when you remove the others. That means that there is no redundancy and that is hard to believe. Therefore, in that case, I believe that all these proteins are working in the, in the uh, making of the mRNP particle and if you don't make them properly, then you increase the, the chance of this RNA to go back to the DNA. Mm -hmm. I think Roy Parker's talk last night, right. talking about potential right. different ways of thinking about right. all the helicases Ab that absolutely, are in the cell. Absolutely, absolutely. And then I, I believe that those helicases, the major function are this one, as RNA helicases have to deal with double standard RNA. Yep. Uh, but collaterally, some of them, and UAP56 that yesterday Roy Parker was talking about mm -hmm. too, no? is so abundant in the cell that partially one of the, 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 the things that it does is to remove the habit. You have to think that these proteins work co-transcriptionally. Mm -hmm. You can see them uh, in, the, in the DNA, they are recruited to chromatin at the same time that there is transcription. Therefore, they are there during transcription. Then it makes sense that they might do that job. So I guess the other question I have is when you start thinking about You've got the polymerase and all its accessory factors, and now you've got all the factors that are binding the RNA, and now these he's, yeah. these cases that are right. there sort of on surveillance. Yeah. It starts to feel like a very crowded environment. Absolutely. And, and so you said that you know, you've know you got an example where something is talking to a chromatin right. modeler, and I, I wonder what you mean by talking to and, and how, how direct these interactions are likely to be sort of in this very complex soup. Yeah. I believe that it's in a complex structure. I don't think it's a direct interaction. We can see that in vivo it happens in the nuclei, but when we check other proteins that we know they interact also with, yeah. for example, the thought complex, we can see also that they interact. Then we believe that there is there a, a, a large complex that is able to interact. We don't know physically who is making the, the real interaction. We need to explore this further. But certainly, this is, as you mentioned, a, a crowded structure. Yeah. But probably there are different things going on at different times. For example, 
one interesting thing we are approaching now is what happened between G1 and S phase. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things we are observing is that not all proteins are protecting from hybrids in the in the different stages of the cell cycle. When you remove some of them, you see an increase in G1 but, and, and, and also in S phase, but some other, when you remove them, you see an increase in hybrids in S phase, but not in G1. Therefore, some of these proteins may have a specialized function, not probably only in specific structure, but during the cell cycle. Therefore, we have to deal with many things. And of course, when we go into the human cell, now, now there are very strong evidence but that in, in neurons, hybrids are formed uh, at high levels. And mm -hmm. therefore, probably what is happening in non-cycling cells versus cycling cells is something that we have to explore further because the factors that protect one versus another may be different. And so when you think about different cell types where you, you have to worry about our loops, right and sort of the, the biology and then the physiology right. downstream. Right. I mean, what are, what are going to be the implications of understanding this, these mechanisms? Well, I mean, that is a, a, a very important question, and this is what makes uh, our research uh, going into the side of biomedicine, because as you know, genome instability is a hallmark of cancer cells. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if we get many are loops and that at the same time are leading to, to, to genome instability, this is something that we expect to be increased in, in, in cancer cells. And for example, one thing that we didn't expect uh, some years ago when we found out that BRCA2, when you remove them, you increase a loop, mm -hmm. I think it's a good connection. It might be that their loop is something uh, present, at least in a number of cancer. And if that is the case, that certainly, certainly the physiology is certainly affected, but at the same time, we can consider that this structure might be used as a diagnostic in some cases or even a, as a target. Because if their loops are, in, uh, are enhanced in a number of, of cancer cells, if you uh, get into some uh, molecule that gets into their loop and block them, you might uh, specifically kill the cells that contain high levels of our loop versus others. Therefore, I think there is a uh, a good uh, reason to, to move farther, not only to understand the conceptual part, mm -hmm. but the implications. And are, I mean, you are, your lab obviously focuses a lot on basic research, but sort of the idea of a molecule being able to get in, right. either as a diagnostic yeah. or as right. a therapy, are you, are you dabbling in that space too? Yeah, we are, we are indeed uh, working on a number of, of tumoral uh, genotoxic agents. Uh, with companies in order to see whether they affect better uh, the cells that are accumulating our loops and whether they target better to regions where their loops are accumulated. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I think that's sort of the questions I have for you. It's very been very nice chatting. Thank you very much. For me, it has been a pleasure, and it's, uh, it's great to talk about science in, in front of the cameras. Yeah. Of course. <laughs>